this exhibition really relates to um, my work as an art historian. I mean, I, I work on, on Dada and Surrealism. At the same time, I work on contemporary art, and it was a way of actually bringing them together and making uh, something which is now part of art history, in other words, Dada, um, meaningful again. And of course, it is very meaningful because so many contemporary artists refer back to it and, and find it exciting. Dada came into being at the, um, during the First World War and um, all of the artists and poets involved felt an absolute revulsion for what was happening uh, in Europe. Um, they felt betrayed, in a sense, by their political leaders. Um, they felt that all values, as it were, had become completely worthless. And so, um, in a sense, Dada not, doesn't just throw art up in the air, if you like, but it throws up traditional moralities, traditional philosophies, uh, humanist ideals, all of these things which they now could no longer believe in anymore. It just throws them all up into the air. One of those things you might say is uh, traditional ideas about identity. Um, you find the Dadaists actually uh, playing around with their own identities in the way that, um, for instance, Marcel Duchamp does uh, in his Eros Salavi gesture. I wanted to say something in the show about masculinity. Um, the title itself, of course, when we think about Dada's boys, there's a play on the idea of the daddy's boy, right? In other words, a kind of male identificatory tradition in art. But, of course, one thinks of Dada's boys as slightly, it sounds as if they're kind of slightly unruly children in a way, you know? Um, so I brought together the, the notion of masculinity, which was important for me in this exhibition, with the idea of a, of a, of a sort of naughty, uh, defiant masculinity. The ready-mades were was a, a sort of new genre of art which was invented by Duchamp. In his desire to overturn traditional aesthetic values and to challenge the way works of art had traditionally been defined, um, Duchamp asserted his right, basically, to take a pre-existing object and simply assert that this is a work of art. And the Nondada is a booklet published by some sort of religious school um, which Duchamp discovered in the house of a friend in the early 1920s. He took one page and, and places that on, on top of the book, as it were, puts a little scrap of paper above the image, uh, which says, the non-dada. You know, he gives it this title. And by doing that, he dismisses this boy as, you know, other. So it's a, it's a gesture, I think, which bring, brings together... The Dada spirit, the idea of the ready-made, the attack on conventional aesthetics with, you know, a comment about masculinity. What it is actually to be part of a modern art movement, a kind of new form of subculture, Dada. I mean, Dada could be seen as a kind of forerunner of subculture in the 20th century, or sub subcultures in the 20th century in any case, which is why the title Dada's Boys, again, gets kind of reactivated. What's interesting in, in terms of the history of art, really, is that the art of the 60s and 70s by male artists um, which, concerning male identity was often quite masochistic. It's as though the, the rather negative of Im image of men which was being put forward in, in feminist theory in the period was actually being, as it were, interjected by the men. And so they, they actually produce you know, the kind of the, uh, works in which they inflict punishment on themselves and so on. If you look at some of Chris Bur think about some of Chris Burden's performance work, for instance, um, what is rather different about the view of masculinity in the art of the 80s and 90s is that suddenly you get this, this, this kind of celebration of um, a, a kind of unreformed um, male identity, which I think is actually quite brave. Um, as though, you know, there's a sort of, you could see it as a kind of um, uh, fighting back against feminism, but I don't think it is just that. I think it's actually a real attempt by men to, as it were, rediscover themselves or parts of themselves. I have to imagine a situation in the early 80s when those ready-made by Marcel Duchamp would almost look like antiques. 
what Jeff Koons is doing, I think, is sort of updating the ready-made very radically, um, partly in the light of what Andy Warhol had done in the 1960s. And so now you have the most sort of up-to-date, chic, mass-produced, but glossy sort of object that you could possibly find as a ready-made, which I think is a little different to the way that Duchamp thought about this. What's interesting about Jeff Koons is he's so obviously heterosexual and he plays around with heterosexuality. Um, so that obviously balls, we, you know, has an obvious male reference. I'm sure he was well aware of that. But he's also, of course, um, referencing the idea of sport. And, you know, this is a basketball. And uh, um, I'm, well, we know that, in fact, he was very involved at that time in um, issues around the idea of um, class, really, because a lot of uh, young black Americans at that time, and possibly still, uh, would see basketball as a way of actually uh, shifting their, their social status, you know, by becoming sports stars, basically. Um, and that was part of the context in which this work was actually made. I mean, there is an, almost an offensive side to it, if you see it in a certain way. Uh, here's a white, very wealthy, middle-class guy dealing with these issues around black culture. And in a sense, uh, um, exploiting them in a certain way um, and for a lot of people that would be problematical and there are other aspects of Jeff Koons's work which would be equally problematical for a lot of people for instance the sex pictures he made in the early 1980s which essentially are sort of pornographic things um, so I mean, but in that way I think Jeff Koons returns us to the spirit of Dada which was often they had very little truck with conventional morality and with good taste and decorum, you know? And so again, we're going back there to that sort of boyish impulse that I wanted to try and get at in the exhibition. It's great that we've got a, a, you know, a young Scottish artist um, in a show here with you know, some really major international figures. And um, humorously, really, during the installation of this, uh, we've been We've been talking to Keith as though he's our resident, um, you know, kind of Dada's boy, you know, in a sense. Uh, and he's here, and in a sense, you know, he is up against the big boys. And that might sound flippant, but in a way that kind of dynamic is, is partly what's involved here, because uh, any young artist now who's making work in the tradition of, of Duchamp, has that sense, you know, having to face up to this patriarch, in a way, of art history, which is what Duchamp, I mean, Duchamp is so massive. His influence has been enormous. Uh, he is, in a way, a patriarch, and there is a sense, therefore, of having to sort of face up to him. The curious thing, though, is that uh, I, I don't think Duchamp is a forbidding figure, in a way, for a lot of young artists, uh, because he licenses humor, he licenses play, uh, irreverence, and so on. So he's a very, uh, to talk of Duchamp as a patriarch is a slightly sort of odd thing. But nevertheless, this is what I'm trying to say about the relationship of a contemporary artist to, some, to, to Duchamp or to Dada. There is that kind of um, understandable uh, challenge involved. And I think you know, Keith's aware of that, and he's facing up to it in a very, very interesting way. There's dialogue here with, with all kinds of aspects of, of, of Duchamp, I mean, just to play on the idea of glass. Duchamp's most famous work was the large glass. And I'm absolutely sure that Keith's aware of that. Um, Keith, I think, is also responding to the um, playoff between the sexes, which occurs within the large glass by Marcel Duchamp. Uh, the other title of that work is The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelors Even. And um, the large glass is about the, the kind of relationship between the bride and the bachelors an attempt to bring the sexes together in a very ironic way. And that also happens, I think, in uh, Keith's work. Here you see the, the glasses arranged on the floor of the gallery uh, as though they were couples uh, at a, some sort of function, you know, kind of like a, um, uh, some sort of soiree, some, or even an art opening, perhaps. Um, and so, in a sense, the glasses that people would hold at one of these events now actually become the people. There's a sort of transposition going on there, which I think is actually slightly surrealist in a way, although there is still, as I've suggested, a reference to Duchamp, who's so interested in the, uh, the kind of interaction of the sexes. The reason that I 
put Sarah Lucas in the exhibition uh, was obviously to create a sort of ironic point. I mean, she's like an honorary Dada's boy in this show. Um, but placing her next to the boys has an interesting, interesting effect because if you look at her work next to someone like Keith Farker's work, which is more or less opposite to it in the gallery space, his work actually becomes, begins to look very seductive and feminine, and she actually assumes the male role. And so this helped, in a sense, just placing her in the context of this work in the show, helped to kind of make points about the mutability of gender, um, the fact that it's not necessarily a stable thing. It can shift around. And male identity doesn't necessarily have to just be, as it were, linked to biological males. All we have here is basically an ink splash. Um, it's a work which probably took a split second to make. It's called La Sainte Vierge as the Holy Virgin. You couldn't have anything more blasphemous, basically. Rather than you know, produce an iconic image uh, of venerating the, you know, the Madonna, you just throw a, uh, ink at a piece of paper, and there you are. So there's a Dada side to this work, which is all about you know, using chance and you know, which defies traditional aesthetics. But there's also uh, a side of this work to do, I think, with bodily processes. Now, the title, La Sainte Vierge, connotes the idea of, of a sort of unsolid, you know, kind of virginal uh, innocence. And in a way, uh, this is about almost the opposite principle. And if you really wanted to delve deeply into it, then I think this could even be the image of you know, precisely that which is not supposed to have occurred in the case of the Virgin Mary. It could be the image of a defloration. And the irony of all this, is, of course, is that if this is a feminine stain, it nevertheless gave birth to a tradition of male stains in 20th century art. Um, and this exhibition has several examples of that. In a sense, updating the whole tradition in a very exciting and interesting way. There is a, a video by Nut Asdam. It's not necessarily easy to look at it. And if you are looking at it, are you actually looking at a man's vulner vulnerability, in a way? The sort of thing you might do when you're afraid? Um, or are we looking at a man, as it were, liberating himself in some way? You know, just as young children, uh, before they can really sort of control their bladders, you know, there's perhaps some sort of um, sensual enjoyment to be got from that, okay? So, I mean, you know, how one interprets that work is, is, would be very interesting. But what I'm saying is it, it speaks to the Picabia, and it speaks also to the complex metaphorical play in Picabia over time. At the same time, one finds stains galore, and splashes in other works, in Paul McCarthy and in John Bock. In John Bock, it's very playful. Um, and the other um, Paul McCarthy work is much more serious. And here, the man becomes some kind of horrible, grotesque ogre figure playing around with these two little dolls, and the whole thing seems to be a sort of um, a commentary on conditioning and the way adults condition children. Um, and there is also perhaps a really rather disturbing, abusive edge to that as well. This slightly dark element to this show is, is actually important, and um, it's picked up a great deal in, in the great big Richard Prince painting that we have here, which is about the size of a Barnett Newman painting you know, one of the great American painters of the 1950s. Um, it's obviously an allusion, in a sense, to that tradition, but um, Prince brings together the great sort of formalist tradition of American art with the idea of the joke. And that painting is actually called The Black Joke, and it actually has two jokes on it, both of them, in fact, you know, problematic in lots of ways. And it's a kind of politically incorrect painting, which, as it were, is self-reflexively uh, politically incorrect. It knows that it's doing something problematic, naughty, but nevertheless brings that out into the open in a certain kind of way. Um, and that's something, again, that interests me about this idea of exploring certain quite taboo areas of masculinity and of male interaction, the idea of male humour, which can often actually play on incorrectness and badness. A number of ideas in the show are really summed up in Matthew Barney's work, 
a video called Cremaster 4. And it's a very strange film indeed, uh, which seems to, we seem to be sort of following the adventures of a sort of um, satyr-like creature. Uh, now, in classical mythology, satyrs, which were a sort of half man and half goat, were symbols of virility. He's clearly sort of using some idea about masculinity there. But at the same time, of course, this satyr character is, seems to be set in some sort of futuristic, strange kind of semi-science fiction setting as well. There are sort of uh, TT the races going on at the same time. So there is a kind of blending of, of classical mythology and, and technology going on here. Um, so that as though, it's as though some sort of myth around masculinity or even a future form of masculinity is being sort of enacted. Uh, in that sense, it seems to me that um, Barney could even be presenting us with a, a vision of what might, man might become in the future. And we hear all the time about the way that men are becoming kind of redundant in a way. Uh, rather sad, but um, they are thought to have lost a lot of their social role. Um, their identities, in a sense, are in confusion. And it's as though Barney, in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way, is suggesting that man now needs to... Is it, uh, uh, metamorphose to change, to become something other. And he's playing around with that idea of, of some kind of strange hybrid uh, version of what man might become. Uh, all of this, I think, in a slightly humorous and, and sur surreal sort of way.